The idea of trying to make others happy in order to increase your own happiness may seem counterintuitive at first. But my guest who has joined me today from the US has found in his study that people can experience a boost in their own happiness if they attempt to make others happy. Dr. Mil Latitova is an assistant teaching professor in the psychology department at the University of Washington. She is also the director of the happiness and well-being lab at the university. Her research interests include happiness and well-being, especially how cultural and personality differences affect people's well-being. She also investigates how people's relationships with the places and spaces they occupy are connected to happiness. Today, I will talk to her about her happiness study. Dr. Milla, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Yep. Okay. So uh, today's discussion, I think, will focus on two areas. Uh, number one is your study on happiness. And number two, as you are from Russia and you have done a study on uh, Russian happiness, how Russian people uh, express their happiness in front of strangers. So we're going to also have a, a discussion on that, on that. So first, I want to start with your happiness study. As I said in the introduction uh, about a happiness study, that you have done and you have found that if, if people uh, make attempts to make others happy, it will actually boost their happiness. So before we go into that, let's start with a uh, basic thing. So what made you interested in studying happiness and well-being academically? Yeah, that's a question, you know, I get a lot from my students, especially, and they're like, well, how did you find what you want to study? And it's uh, actually a lot more kind of serendipitous than uh, you would think, uh, because when I was an undergraduate student, I knew that I was interested in like, getting involved in research and maybe doing my own research for the first time. And I was just lucky that one of the professors who was working at my institution where I, I got my bachelor's degree just happened to be a happiness researcher. And I was specifically at that time, I was very interested in cross-cultural um, differences when it comes to psychology, just more generally. And then we kind of uh, combined our interests. And the very first study that I've ever done had to do with kind of cross-cultural differences when it comes to um, happiness and kind of, kind of uh, happiness-inducing interventions. And then it just kind of skyrocketed from there. And I was just like, well, who doesn't want to study happiness? Like everyone wants to be happy, right? So it's very interested. To, so I got very interested in kind of understanding that further. And yeah, still interested in cross-cultural differences, but kind of... Uh, branch out from there into other topics as well, like, you know, such as that study that you mentioned that is not necessarily uh, taking a kind of cross-cultural perspective. Yeah, I understand. So your study has found that happiness comes from trying to make others feel good rather than oneself. So tell us more about your study. Yes. Um, so this kind of idea comes from a lot of previous research that shows that generally helping others, buying things for others, like all of that has been shown to be connected to increases in happiness comparing to doing all of those things to yourself. And in this study, me and my collaborator were really interested in kind of extending that further and just like, well, what about you just genuinely try to make someone happy, right? That can include various different things versus comparing it to what happens when you make try to make yourself happy, which what we often do, you know, especially like when we feel down, we usually kind of concentrate on ourselves, trying to fix ourselves first, and only then like try to be social and interact with other people. And here we kind of took this different approach. And what we asked our participants was pretty simple. We assigned them randomly to two different conditions. And in one condition, we asked them to do something that they know works to make themselves um, happy or improve their mood. And in the other condition, we asked them to do the same, but for someone else in their life. And it could have been like literally anyone from a stranger on the street to like a parent or child or uh you know significant other roommate what have you and we did find that uh actually doing something to try and to improve others happiness and well-being was a lot more helpful for the participants own happiness and well-being rather than concentrating on their own which it seems kind of counter counterintuitive but it does fall in line with a lot of previous research and kind of theoretical frameworks um, that are also out there that kind of explain why that happens. Yeah, exactly. I understand. And what exactly, 
what exactly is something that produces this result? Like if, if I make some attempts to make others happy uh, and it will actually boost my happiness as your study has found. So what is actually at play here? What exactly is the thing that produces this effect or this result? What have you found? Yeah, so we found that uh, kind of the explanation for this effect is the fact that we, when we interact with other people, we get an increased sense of relatedness or like connectedness with others, which we know is very important for our happiness. We just know the relationship. We're social creatures, right? People are social. We're kind of hardwired to really get a lot from um, social interactions. And oftentimes, you know, when I get like a little pushback, when I say that, you know, like, oh, everyone needs relationship in their life. Some people are like, okay, not everyone is extrovert like you. So like, come down like not everyone needs to talk to people constantly and such which is very true uh, but all of us need meaningful relationship and it doesn't mean that like we all need to find us the, the one or whatever we just need some kind of meaningful relationship in our life and that's true that there are individual differences when it comes to that as well some people want to be friends with a lot of people and have constant social interactions and other people just need that one person in their life who provides that meaningful um relationship that they know that someone cares about them they know that they care about someone and what kind of we did in our study we showed that when we try to make uh, um, others happier or improve their mood we do get that sense of connection connection with other people and we feel related to them and that's what really kind of explains that boost to our happiness and well-being in that specific condition yeah i understand so it's all about having a sense of connection and really connecting with others. So that's what actually driving your happiness when you are trying to make other people happy. So that's what you found in your study, right? Yes, yes. And, and I think also, you know, a, a lot of people really did understand, kind of realize how important can, sense of connection is during the pandemic, right? When we all felt a little lonely and isolated, right? And, a, you know, all of us felt that regardless of kind of those individual differences in terms of, you know, extroversion or what have you. So I think that, yeah, that kind of easier to understand those results now that we went uh, through this, you know, kind of time of isolation. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And also, uh, there are other studies that have produced the similar results. So those studies have also found that if you want to make others or if you like, you know, make attempts to make others happy, it will actually help uh, you to become happy as well. So I think your result actually is pretty similar to uh, the studies that have been done before. Uh, in this area of human psychology or human relationship. So anyway, uh, did your study measure whether this happiness is short-lived or lasting? Yeah, we only looked at kind of short-term effects uh, of the study, not necessarily kind of a lasting effect. Um, however, I can kind of assume that if, if something, if it would be an ongoing practice that someone does, I would, expect there to be a long lasting effect. I don't, I wouldn't expect that if one time you do something to improve somebody's happiness and then you're just like, whoa, happiness boost for weeks. I wouldn't expect that to happen. But if someone engages in those kind of practices over a period of time, you would get those kind of short-term boosts that will all kind of add, add up and will kind of create a longer term, term boost. The one thing that I would kind of um, keep in mind for someone maybe trying to kind of try to do that, uh, it's important to kind of switch it up a little bit. So you don't want to do the same exact thing over time because we know we do tend to kind of get used to things even the most wonderful things right it's kind of similar to like you know whatever is your like favorite food or favorite dessert if you're going to have it every night it's going to kind of lose its uh, appeal a little bit right so similarly here you know if your thing is you know doing like this one great thing for your spouse for instance well don't do the same thing maybe don't do it for the same person but if you switch it up if you do something nice for your friend today if it's a different thing for your spouse tomorrow and then this great thing for your neighbor then you will kind of be able to observe that long-term effect from kind of keep practicing that in various different ways yeah i understand so uh you have to you have to, you know, change, you have to do different types of activities and 
uh, try to make others happy if you want to have a long lasting effect from mm-hmm. uh, from from your acts of acts of kindness or you know like charitable acts or something like that so when you are trying yes. to make make other people happy don't just focus on one thing and do it again and again so mm-hmm. change it and do different things and then maybe and maybe you will feel like different effects of those specific acts and how they are affecting your mood and well being and subjective well being or happiness whatever you call it so anyway uh in terms of trying to make others feel good and happy what type of activities will produce the maximum happiness in others what do you think is it like charitable act mm-hmm. or you know like helping someone who is in a difficult situation you know something like that so what type of activities are we talking about here yeah it seems like it i would say like doesn't matter but it's variety of activities that have a pretty strong effect so specifically in our study we ask our participants like well what did you actually do and we found that no matter how we like try to categorize those things like it just didn't matter it, there was no connection between those categories of things that people were doing and the you know the effects that we observed on well-being so it seemed that it's it is variety of different activities can uh, produce that great effect is just kind of the the fact that you're taking the focus from improving something for yourself and kind of switching it on to others i think that's kind of the where the key um thing happens right but what is it specifically um that is kind of a you know a different thing where we at least in our studies we didn't necessarily find um a specific type of activity that was more effective than other yeah i understand so now let's talk about something that is related to culture and that's also that also that is also related to another study that you did so that study has found that russians inhibit the expression of happiness to strangers but not to friends or families so tell us more about this study you know i really found it really really interesting Yes, uh I think that have have you ever been to Russia or interacted well, no, with a lot of no, Russians? No, yes. I ha- I have been to Finland only. So <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Yeah, I actually have not been to Finland unfortunately. Even though I have some Finnish roots, uh okay. interestingly enough, I'm like, you know, mostly Russian but part Finnish. Okay. Uh but anyway, in Russia, um when you like if you talk to a lot of like tourists for, especially from US who travel to Russia they would be like wow people all look so grim they look so miserable and so unhappy but then you know being from like i know people are not miserable or unhappy people generally you know have about you know same level of happiness uh for the most part as you know in other places in the world so in this particular study we're interested in kind of figuring out what is going on is that really the reflection of how people really truly feel and then the fact that people you know if you walking in the you know streets of moscow and petersburg and you f- see all this like super unhappy faces is that kind of reflecting how people feel or is it something different and it's more of a cultural norm or kind of a rule of how you're supposed to display your emotions and um what we found in our study was that yes indeed it's actually the latter it's the cultural rule uh about the display of the emotion because it's just culturally not appropriate to smile and express happiness to strangers or acquaintances authority figures so like anyone who is not very close to us however it's absolutely totally normal and appropriate to do that to like you know family members or close friends or you know romantic partners and such but interestingly in our study we also measured happiness levels of our participants right to kind of get at that right so we found that participants happiness levels didn't actually differ that much so american participants in our sample were just as happy as russian uh, participants and there was not that much difference however when we ask participants about kind of would you be willing to express your happiness to strangers Russian participants were like yeah no not a lot of them were were willing to do that but american participants yeah totally sure you know i I'll, i'll do that that's to, to, totally fine so that's kind of explains this uh you know difference in terms of what you see and what people actually feel down inside it just doesn't match up as well um amongst russian and again if you know if you if you befriend a russian and you become their friend they will they will, you will see their happiness plenty it's just when you're you know walking down in the street you don't see that yeah 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 i understand 
And so it's, it's, it's actually about a cultural norm rather than how you truly feel inside, right? For, at least for mm -hmm. Russian. Yeah. I understand. Okay, so unlike Russians, Americans do not hide the expression of positive emotion in front of strangers. So why is that? That's also part of the culture, you think? Yes, that's uh, definitely also part of the culture. And especially given that um, happiness is generally like really valued in American culture. It's in our uh, Declaration of Independence, right? The pursuit of happiness. It's, it's, you know, a fundamental right. So it's something that is like so central to American culture and American identity that it's kind of expected that you're going to be showing the fact that you're happy, right? And then kind of, you know, smiling very widely and you know, really expressing your happiness and showing it to everyone and there is no cultural reasons for that not to happen like there is in in russia yeah yeah i understand so uh you are a russian living in the u.s how has this affected your happiness yeah i definitely so uh as you can see i'm smiling and you know uh, a lot and i'm just generally kind of like a happy smiling laughing person and i do love to smile at strangers I very much enjoy that uh, about American culture. And I, yeah, for, for me, that's like a, a, a norm that fits me better for sure. And uh, yeah, and I remember when I moved, so I've been living in the United States for 14 years now, so it's been a while. But I remember when I moved originally, I remember my friends from um, Russia would comment on like how I'm smiling in the pictures different, like more in American way, <laughs> you know, kind of like a more open smile, kind of excited smile. Uh, which is, you know, this, yeah, the case. Like, I guess, you know, I got acculturated. So I'm kind of expressing the cultural norms. And we also know from research generally that um, in terms of our happiness, like we want to be in the culture that fits what our personality, our values are. And for me, that's kind of a better fit with United States. And, you know, I am, as I mentioned, very extroverted person. Extroversion is very valued in the United States. It's not that valued in Russia. So, yeah. Yeah, so I'm kind of, you know, to me, it's a better fit. So I feel much better living in the United States. But, um, you know, it's not, it, it, it really depends on the person, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So you are not actually like the typical Russian that you studied in your study, where you found that Russians typically do not smile to strangers and do not show uh, their expression of happiness to strangers. So I think you are a different type of Russian who is actually the opposite, <laughs> who loves to yeah. smile and who uh, shows the happy expression to strangers, like you are doing it now with me. So I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can totally understand why you are different. So now let's talk about something really interesting. And this Russian word, so is it azart? Is it A-R-T? Is it azart? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I was actually reading a book on happiness and i found it there so uh, in the book it's written that azart has been said to be associated with happiness in russia so tell us more about it and its cultural significance in russia yeah, that's an interesting word. So I'm not familiar with a lot of research on that. So just all I can tell you is just like me being Russian telling you what I know. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a weird word because it's hard to translate it into English because I, I was like, I even like looked it up in like a Google translate or whatever. And they were like passion. I'm like, no, that's not that's not it. It's it's like a a combination between like gambling and passion. So it's like somewhere between, because it's not just like, there is a lot of hazard involved in, in when you're gamble, but it's not all it, right? It's just, it can be present in like many different other uh, parts of life. And it's just kind of like that aspect of passion mixed with risk-taking that is, you know, it's just a, just a really interesting um, kind of, word really and kind of describing this thing and and i think it is a really prominent thing is like in russian culture and when you think about like uh classic russian literature you see a lot of that right so you see all of this um kind of you know, like i'm thinking of like a lot of dueling you know duels people like deciding you know their things and so you have to have a lot of um azart to, <laughs> to to get into that um yeah so it, it is i think yeah it's an interesting phenomenon um and yeah i i'm like i'm, I'm not 
not sure how to like wrap my head around it in terms of like comparing it to how it's experienced in like American culture or like other cultures. Because, you know, there's like, I think there is a reason why there's no word for it in, you know, kind of like, or like a good translation um, for it in English because it's not kind of as prominent or, um, yeah, so like, like I can't think of a word, like it's one word is negative and the other word is positive and it's kind of the mix of the two. So it's, yeah, it's a, it's a weird one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that was my last question for you. So we're going to end the meeting now. And thank you, Dr. Milla, for your time. I really enjoyed talking to you. And good luck with your future research on happiness and well being. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a Goodbye. pleasure. Goodbye.